daylight savings uh, day. All that fun stuff. Slim Pickens earlier this morning, 7.30. It was a good time, but uh, I know some of us probably didn't set that alarm clock back uh, the way we were called to do it. I know for us, for example, we set ours back, uh, got up this time. Oh, set it forward, excuse me, that's right, set it forward. I set it forward, and it was beautiful because it was about 7, I think 7 o'clock last night when we set it forward, and then all of a sudden it was 8 o'clock, which is bedtime for the kids. So that was just wonderful in itself. I said, you know what, guys, it's time to go to bed. It's time to go to sleep right now. It's 8 o'clock. If you don't believe me, you check 8 o'clock in the house. It's time to go to bed. So that was beautiful, to be able to set that forward like that. Uh, and get going. But uh, again, always a uh, pleasure and an honor to be here with you on this morning uh, to share God's word with, with all of us. We all get a taste of what he has in store for us and what he continues to have in store for us throughout our lives. I'm also thankful to uh, leadership and Brother Hubbard as well uh, for always extending this special opportunity uh, my way. I'm greatly, greatly thankful for that and always acknowledging my beautiful wife, India. Uh, she's well, she was doing double duty, but also thanks to the support of my Aunt Linda as well. Uh, and the kids, uh, my wife does a wonderful job uh, working with us. And it's been, it's been fun. It's been quite a journey thus far with three chillin', as, as I like to say, three chillin'. <laughs> it's been quite a good time. And uh, you, Minnie, and I, and I were discussing just the balance idea, just learning how to balance and put things in the proper order and perspective uh, while we're working three strong now. Uh, and so there's five in the plan. Uh, I think we're good to go. Uh, we're good to go, so don't ask <laughs> if it's going to be any more. But now the next step I, I do have to share is, with the, I'm a van man. I'm, I'm trying to get this van going here. My wife's already shaking her head no. I'm trying to uh, get us to talk her into or persuade her, if you will, into working with that van because it's just so much room. What do you all agree? Amen. Thank you. I just thought I'd ask. There's so much room for the van. But, uh, We'll see what happens. <laughs> My wife has already said no. No bands is not going to happen. But again, we're having a great time and uh, it's been quite, quite fun working uh, with our children and watching them develop and grow. And even our baby at this point, three months old, uh, trying to bear his weight, trying to stand and, and, and play really with his, with his brother and sister. So we just, that's, if anything, if that's a foreshadow or if anything, we know he's going to be taken off here quite soon. Uh, to get in there and play with big brother and big sister. But again, thank you for your prayers and support uh, as well as we continue to, to move forward. And might I also say, it's, it's spring break is coming around the corner here. We're very excited in the world of education. Uh, for spring break, we've had all kinds of testing and all kinds of different things coming about. And our kids have, have gone through a lot, I should say, at this point. I know for some of us, I don't recall testing as much as, as some of our kids do. Uh, these days. There's so many tests. I don't know if I would make it, to be honest with you. Uh, but our kids are making it. They're doing a nice job of that. So we all are anticipating uh, that break just so we can get our batteries recharged and the kids all as well uh, have a bit of a break and we come back in and uh, finish out the race as we get ready to close out school in May. Um, and with that said, too, I believe, I don't know if the announcement was already made about KIC, uh, Junior Worship Service. KIC, that is happening today. If there's any students that want to go on the back, I would have brought to my attention. Do you have any takers? If you want to, you can head on to the back at this time for a kick or for the junior worship uh, service as well. Just want to throw that out there to you. So while that transition is happening, we'll go ahead and, and get into our lesson coming from John chapter 5. And we're really going to look at the whole, well not the whole chapter, verses 1 through 15, but there's an emphasis placed upon uh, 5, excuse me, verses 5 and 9, which we will take a look at here uh, at this point. If you will go with me, John chapter 5. If you will repeat after me, verse 6, when you get there. John chapter 5, verse 6. 
I see some of you have an expanded size Bible. I think it's about time. I'm working with this little thing here. It'll make me get a new prescription. Uh, if I keep looking, looking hard into it, it's, it's rough. So if, I, if I'm a, a, a second delay, please bear with me. Uh, so I'm feeling the strains of, <laughs> of having such a small Bible at this time. Again, that's John chapter 5. Verse 6. Please read after me. When Jesus saw him lying there. When Jesus saw him lying there. And knew that he had already been in that condition a long time. And knew that he had already been in that condition a long time. He said to him. He said, he said to him. Do you want to be made well? Do you want to be made well? What a wonderful question. A question that all of us should be posing. Or at least maybe have posed to ourselves. As we look at our lesson on this morning. Uh, if you would look at someone close to you and ask them. Do you really want to be made well? Amen. Do you really want to be made well? You know, some people have ambitions, they have goals. I think a lot of people set goals in, in, in January of 2016. Actually, set them December 31st, I should say, in 2015. I've got goals. There's some things I really want to be able to do. I know for some, they said I want to try a new workout regimen, or I want to lose, or to gain weight, or I want to... Uh, do something in particular, but then that question pops up. Do you really do you really say you want to get away? <laughs> do you really want to do this? Um, and I know I've been guilty of this too. I've had my resolutions and, and, and I didn't know what I was really getting into when I said what I was when I said what I said. And then when I got there, then that question was, was posed, do you really want to do this? And I don't know about you, but I backed out sometimes. Uh, sometimes I don't want to do it. I remember trying out for the basketball team, thinking it was going to be a breeze. Do you really want to be on this team? Well, we're going to run a series of suicides, if you're familiar with those. We're going to run from this side of the court to that side. You're going to touch down. We're going to do that for about you know, a minute and a half. And a lot of people were posing that question. Do you really want to be a part of the basketball team? I think when I was, uh, actually went off to college and I studied music, uh, there were some challenges there. If you really want to be a part of this music program, mind you, uh, you're going to have to know a series of scales. If you know anything about music, scales are, are very, that's the basics, those are the foundations. You better know how to play your instrument. You better know how to do a solo. Oh, and by the way, Monty, you better know how to play piano. Oh, yeah? <laughs> oh, and by the way, Monty, you better know how to sing. Okay? Oh, and by the way, Monty, you better know how to do what we call sight reading, which means I'm going to give you some music you've never seen before in your life, and you're going to sing it right here on the spot. You better be ready to do that kind of stuff if you're going to go to a rigorous music program. I thank the Lord he blessed me. <laughs> I was able to get through. I scrapped by with a little piano. I was able to sing a few tunes. But uh, that was a question I had to pose myself from time to time. Do I really want to? Can I really do this? I remember my first year teaching. No, first two, three years teaching. Uh, there were some things that I learned in the textbook, but some things wasn't textbook. Uh, I don't know how to handle that situation. Or what do I do in that particular case? And uh, I've been finding myself asking the question, do I really want to really do this? Can I make it? Can I make it here? We are even told in the book of Luke, Jesus tells us before we decide we want to engage in a relationship with God, to have an authentic relationship, we better weigh out the cost before you just all of a sudden say, I want to be a Christian. And he warns us of that because it's tough work being a Christian. Is it that? If anybody has an easy way, let us know. <laughs> Sister Pittman says she has an easy way. What's your way? Just easy. Just easy. Just do what he says do. Right. <laughs> and it's easy from there. And the way that he says do it. But oftentimes we're polled with these types of questions. And again, in this particular context, in John chapter 5, Jesus asked this important question uh, to a man who had been sick for 38 years. So we're going to unpack a few core ideas learn a few things along the way, uh, and then the lesson will be yours. But starting off in John chapter 5, we see that Jesus is traveling from Galilee to Jerusalem. And what's interesting is that as he's on this journey, or I should say prior to his journey, he has already performed two core <coughs> miracles to help people understand his deity, his godhood, that he's fully man and fully God at the same time. The first miracle that we're aware of in John, or the book of John, is the turning of water into wine. That's amazing in itself. And then the second miracle that we come upon is uh, Jesus healing a nobleman's son. 
The man comes to Jesus directly, expressing the need of concern for his son who is ill, and Jesus takes care of that as well by means of a miracle. And when I say miracle, uh, you actually won't find that term in the Bible. I guess I should say a sign or a wonder. And when I say that, these are things, these miracles or signs, these are things that are done instantaneously. What makes a sign or a wonder or a miracle a miracle <coughs> is that these are supernatural things that are done that defy all laws that we know of today. <clears throat> to turn water into wine instantly, that is a miracle. Right. To be able to look at someone and say, you are now well, or to lay hands on someone and to cure them of a disease, that's a miracle. That's a sign, that's a wonder. <laughs> to be able to say to someone, you're gonna be well in about four more weeks, that's the kind of signs people look for today. That's, I wouldn't quite call that a miracle. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Anybody in here been sick? Yeah. Yeah. We pray over that as well. It might take some, some time, <laughs> exactly, some rest, take some, uh, some night well, and over, yeah. some, over time and plenty of sleep, you're going to get well. But I share that because uh, these signs and wonders, uh, we have biblical evidence to suggest that these types of signs are ones that are happening today. I mean, when's the last time we've seen anyone being raised from the dead like that? Really, it ain't going to happen like that either. It's just not going to happen. But Jesus is allowing these things to happen and putting these wonders forth so that people can understand, one, that he is God. Mm -hmm. And that they can understand and follow him and make a commitment onto him. In other words, people need to see in order to believe. We don't really need to see in order to believe because we have access to faith. And we also have access to the word of God in itself. And as 1 Corinthians 13 has pointed out, there will come a time in which these signs, these wonders, all these things will pass. In other words, they serve their purpose. So therefore, we're not so much called to use that term, I should say, miracle or, or sign or wonder. They serve their purpose. But Jesus has performed at least two core ones right now. And then he's going to come into this third core miracle here in John chapter 5. So he's making his way up from uh, Galilee to Jerusalem. And he goes to an area called Bethesda, which means the house of mercy. And Bethesda is located near the temple. The temple is actually north of the temple, which is close to the sheep gate, which is usually where the sacrifices uh, that initiates the idea of the sacrifice is going to be taking place with the animals. But he goes to Bethesda, and there's five columns, or these five colonnades that are within this area. And there's a pool right next to it. Please look at someone next to you and tell them, Jesus goes to the sick. He goes to the sick. It would be something if you saw, well, typically when celebrities come in town, you probably wouldn't expect them to go to the hospital first when a celebrity comes into a town. Or someone of high stature or status. Probably they're going to go to the places... They're going to go to places where they're going to be able to find people upon their class or more well-known figures. That's where they're going to go for the extravagant uh, delicacies and luxuries. They're going to go there. But you're not going to find probably many people, big names, going directly to Methodist Hospital as soon as they come here. What's interesting here is that Jesus doesn't go to any of these higher order places. He goes straight to where the sick people are. And within this area, within this pool, we're seeing multitudes of people who are sick. And what I mean by that is they're dealing with infirmities. A couple of them. One, we've got people there that are blind, they cannot see. We've got people there that are paralyzed, who can't move. They can't go from one place to the other. There are people there who are lame or halt or crippled or withered. They're having a hard time moving in one direction. And they're all, for some reason, waiting by this pool. Now, interestingly enough, physically, I just shared with you the types of infirmities that people are dealing with. Are you not aware that we are sick as well? Whether we want to say it or not, or believe that we actually are sick as well. Am I talking about out of my mind sick? I'm not necessarily suggesting that. But we all have infirmities or forms of sicknesses that we go through physically and, in a sense, spiritually. Sick. That's why we're here, actually. Because we are sick, and Jesus comes to the sick first. We have folks that actually can be blind here, spiritually. I don't know where to go. I have no direction in my life. Anytime I've done anything, it's just because that was just the thing to do at that particular point in time, and that's just what felt right. 
And whatever else feels right in the future, then that's what I'll do. Blind, no direction, no guidance. There's some here who may be spiritually even paralyzed, stuck in sin. In other words, gotten myself so deep into it, I don't know how to get out. I've oftentimes felt for some of the students who um, had enough trust to, to, to share that they are so deeply caught up into whatever they're caught up in, it really can't get out. Because they've invested so much time and their energy into a gang or into drugs or alcohol or a certain way of life that they're paralyzed now. It's either I'm going to keep on going or someone's going to take me out here shortly. Sometimes, as Christians, we can actually be crippled. Physically, we look great. On the surface, we look just fine. We're doing well. And people think that. But within our hearts, we're crippled in, our, in ourselves. Mm -hmm. Knowing that we're not walking straight for God. Yeah. Knowing that every now and then, I'm going to walk a little bit off to the left, and I'm going to do me for a little bit, then I'm going to come on yeah. back yeah. and create the facade that I really am for God. Christians, all of us, need to be careful not to live such a lifestyle that would be suggestive of us having a crippled heart. Amen. Faking it, so to speak. Faking it till we make it. Everybody here looks good as far as what I can see. But we always have to do that deep internal reflection and ask ourselves, am I really living the way God wants me to live? Am I really sick? Chances are, if you're human, you are. Yeah. Look at someone next to you. Jesus goes to the sick. He goes to the sick because these are people who are dependent upon others. Again, you got people lying around next to this pool. They need people to help move them or to carry them to the pool. And I actually want to address this here. Some of you in your Bibles have, depending on your translation, verses 3 and 4 may be counted as the same verse. In other words, you're missing a fourth verse. Why are these people here in this particular pool, these sick people? Are they here just to hang out? No, they're not there just to socialize. They're there for a particular reason. The Bible tells us, and actually I'll read to you, in case you don't have that in your version, look at verse uh, 3. In these lay a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water. Verse 4. For an angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water. Then whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was made well of whatever disease he had. Now some would create a debate and say that none of that is true. That's not entirely accurate. There wasn't an angel that stirred up the water. That's why in some translations uh, you won't find that particular verse about the angel stirring up the water. I would challenge that because of verse 7. When we look at verse 7, the man gives an excuse, which we'll get into a little bit later, but he gives an excuse as to why he couldn't get into the water, but he talks about the waters being stirred up. That there is evidence that the water was being stirred in some way, shape, or form. And you're going to find verse 7 in everybody's translation. That was not cut out. But the man, people there believed and or knew that something was agitating the water. And so the reason why here is to get in the water when it gets stirred up. They have an understanding that an angel comes down and touches it, agitates it. We're going to get in the water. But the, the issue is that there are other people who can get in the water before he can. Yeah. And others who are sick. So I would challenge that idea, that notion, that that scripture doesn't belong, verse 4 I'm speaking. That's why they're there. Otherwise, why would all these folks be hanging around? If you were sick, would you want to just be hanging around other folks that's sick? Can you imagine what that conversation, or lack of conversation? Everybody too busy, hacking and coughing and whatnot, you can't even get anything out. And you're right, mentally, that's a strain. And emotionally. They're there for a reason, ladies and gentlemen. But they're dependent upon others. They're waiting there with a little inkling of hope, thinking that once I get into the water, I'll be taken care of. Why would Jesus bother going there first? Why, go, why not go to the people that are doing the right thing? Doesn't need to. He said, I came here. He's here to take care of those who are sick. And if we're honest with ourselves, all of us have an infirmity. It's one way or the other. Each and every single one of us has something that we must battle, that we are challenged with each and every single day of our lives. Some have shared it with others, some haven't shared it at all. But all of us have some type of sickness, whether we want to believe it or not. But that's why Jesus said, I'm coming to you first. 
He came there purposefully to the sick. Tell someone Jesus goes to the sick first. That's why he asked the question, do you want to be made well? If you were to ask us that question, do you want to be made well? I don't know about you, but I'm throwing my hand up yes. But to throw my hand up yes would imply that I'm not well. So if I'm not well, something's wrong. And if something's wrong, I need some help. And if I need help, I need that from Jesus. So he goes to the sick first. Tell him next, Jesus wants no excuses. Jesus doesn't want any excuses from us. And we'll take a look at why here. Look at verse 6. Again, Jesus goes to a man who had been sick for 38 years. Now, I am happy to say that God has blessed me and has worked me through a, a back issue that I was having. I think I made, made you all aware that I at least asked for prayers. I was trying to have a herniated disc. And I've been allowed to work through that. And I thank God for that as well. I'm up, I'm moving, tying shoes. I'm, I'm getting back to what I was doing. I was in pain for a couple of months. And that hurt. Can you imagine what that'd be like to be in that kind of pain for a year? For five years of your life? For 10 years of your life? For 38 years, bedridden. In other words, you're not moving. You understand what that may do to the psyche? Mentally knowing I can't get up and go out anymore like I used to. That's challenging. That's why we always pray for those who are, uh, are sick and shut in, for those who cannot get out, because that is a mental and emotional toll. I felt that just within my short period of time. I want to get down and play on the piano if I can't, because I can't sit up straight. It hurts right now. I just want to get down and tie my shoe. Oh, that's pain right there. This man was laid out for 38 years, and Jesus knew that. But he goes to that man in particular, and he asks him the question, do you want to be made whole? And look what the man says to him in verse 7. The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no man to put me into the pool. When the water is stirred up, but while I am coming, another steps down before me. Again, tell someone, Jesus wants no excuses. You ever ask someone a question, just a simple question, it's a yes or no question, and you get a dissertation, something you didn't even ask me for all that? I just asked you, did you do it or did you not? Well, no, you don't understand. You know what? It's rough out here because, you know, it all starts back to last week. No, I don't want to know about last week. I just want to know, did you do it or did you not? Jesus doesn't want our excuses. He just wants to know, are you going to serve me or you're not? He doesn't want this in between or in the middle. You know, I'm with you half the time and I'm with you the other half. Fridays are mine, Lord, but I, I, I'm with you every other day. No. He wants to know a simple question. Do you want to be made well? But what does the man say? He starts to point the finger at other people. You ever been around people that just can't take, just can't own up to what they did? Or what they haven't done, they always point the finger? I think Adam tried that as well, didn't he? I think he, 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 he tried to pull that on his wife. What's the woman you gave me? Well, no, Adam, it's your fault. You, you knew. I put you there first. You knew what to do. But you can't give me a straightforward answer. So the man says, I don't have anyone to help me get in the pool. What's amazing is that even if the, old, or the, the man would have had 12 people to put him in the pool, he still would not have been blessed the way Jesus would bless him. Sometimes we ask for help. When the reality is that we don't need help, we just need Jesus. I don't need help. I just need you, Lord. Even if we do find ourselves asking for help, sometimes we go around it the wrong way asking for help. Sometimes we just don't even check in with God. We go asking help from other people, thinking that other people will help solve our problems. When at the end of the day, it's the Lord we need to be going to first. And what will be is what will be. And we have to be willing to accept that. Tell someone, Jesus wants no excuses. The man claims that no one was there to help him get into the pool. But then he goes a step further and starts to focus on others who are getting into the pool. In other words, he's focusing on others who are doing well. You ever been around people who tend to get caught up on how well others are doing? Some of us stopped sharing our successes with certain individuals because they got so caught up on how, well, how or what we were doing. 
I remember walking up to someone who looked at me and said, uh, you know, saw my suit, and he said, you know, we're paying you too well around here. So now I would walk away. In the back of my mind, I'm like, why are you worried <laughs> about what I'm wearing? Two, you have no idea where the financial income comes from. You're assuming it's just from this job. You have no other idea what else I'm doing. And three, it's none of your business <laughs> at the end of the day. But the man got himself caught up into focusing on others. He took his eyes off the Lord. He focused on how other people are getting into the pool before him. So he's defeated daily, daily. Just defeated because he's focusing on other people. We're not called to focus on others and what they are or are not doing. That's how we wind up getting caught up. Oh, they got a promotion and I didn't. Well, you know, my time to, to speak, I'm going to be a minister here one day. That's my time. Stop focusing on other people. Just do you. Amen? Amen. The man gave two pretty dull excuses when the overall question is, do you want to be made well? Sometimes we give those same dull excuses. The Lord is saying to us, do you want me to help you? I know you're in a rut. I know you've lost direction. I know you can't see where you're going right now. I understand you're stuck in this particular position and can't find a way out. Do you want me to help you? Amen. And what do we sometimes say? The sheep that we are. No, I got it. But when I get a few things together first, let me yeah. take care of my priorities here. Let me get, make sure the money's together. Let me make sure the finances are good. I gotta make sure the job is settled. I gotta make sure that I can do a little bit of me as well. Then. I, I, I'm ready to be well. But that's not what Jesus is asking, is it? Do you want to be made whole or complete or well? And how often we sometimes miss the mark by saying not just yet. Some people just don't want to be made well. There's some that don't have any excuse. I'm fine living the life that I live right now. I get high every Saturday. I get to the club on Friday. I do it up. Life is pretty simple. I don't want, why would I want to be made well? I know how to get my money when I need to, and I know who my contacts are, and I know who my pushers are. I got everything in place. And I know who to call when I need her to come up. Do you really want to be made well, though? Some folks don't want that. Some folks enjoy the paralyzing peace of sin. Some people enjoy being in the world not knowing where to go, but just go wherever the wind takes them. Some people enjoy just doing wrong. And that's a scary position to be in and scary folk to be around. Because that lets you know the conscience is seared. It doesn't matter what I do to you to get what I need to get. Because it's me first, then you. Look at someone next to you and ask them, do you really want to be made well? Tell them, then Jesus wants no excuses. Next, tell them, Jesus heals through grace. Jesus heals through grace. Jesus listens to the man who's been sick for 38 years, giving his excuses. And Jesus decides to help him. Why him? Why not all these other people that are out there? Couldn't Jesus have just healed them as much? What is it that this man did to get Jesus' attention? He did nothing. Just like all of us who had access to Jesus, who put him on in baptism. What did we do for that? We didn't do a thing. He healed us through his grace. He healed us because we have no merit. There's nothing that we've done really to please God. There's nothing that we've done that would put us in a state of mind that says, I deserve that. I don't know about you, but I think we're living in an entitled world today where people expect something for doing nothing. People expect results when they haven't put forth any other work. Yes. I've been amazed that people expect an A when they didn't study. <laughs> or expect extra credit when I couldn't get you to do the regular credit. <laughs> I can't help you. If a whole box of tissue is going to bring you up now. But we're healed through his grace. In verse 8, Jesus tells the man specifically, he says, rise. Take up your bed and walk. Look at someone next to you and tell them, get up. Yeah. Next, tell them, get out. Yeah. I don't go only very literally. There's a meaning behind that. <laughs> Jesus says, rise. Again, another miraculous piece here. It wasn't 
take these pills and I see you in six weeks. No, it wasn't that. It wasn't, well, get up here and rest for a little bit. No, it was miraculous. Get up. The man had enough faith that he got himself up. Yeah. Jesus said, pick up your mat and go. <coughs> Jesus tells us that as well. Even today, he's telling us to get up. I don't know about you, but I've been down and out on my back at times, just wondering, what am I doing? Where, where, where am I? What's going on? And then when I focus it back on the Lord, I can hear the response, just get up. Looking at the scriptures, we're always told, we're given that idea to keep moving forward. Jesus looks towards our future. He says, get up and get out. Yeah, we're stuck in ruts at times. Yes, things are rough in the world. Yes, the, polit the politics are crazy, but church politics can be crazy, just as crazy as well. But even in the midst of all that, Jesus still says, get up. Family is just in shambles. Get up and move. I don't know how I'm going to pay next month's rent. Get up and move. Things just don't make sense to me right now. Get up and move. And that's exactly what Jesus is doing with this man in particular. He tells him to get up, get your mat, and walk. Now, we don't know if this man had a home to go to. But I can surely say he wasn't, he wasn't cured of this just to sit around with all the folks all day. He had a mission now that he was called upon because he was given the opportunity to be able to rise. Tell someone, Jesus heals through grace. Jesus heals through grace. Just so you know as well, the bed that he had. When I first read this, I thought to myself a while ago, how did he get that bed up? <laughs> Then I realized we're not in Value City. We're not in this place. We're, 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 we're not talking about that kind of bed. We're not talking about the frame. But I'm thinking initially, when I read this years ago, he got to get the mattress. He's got to get the who tell him to take the frame down. The headboard, who's carrying that? <laughs> Did you get the sheets? No. Just in case. The bed is a mat that people uh, slept on. That's what they use at times. They pick up your mat and walk. God says, I don't want you to be stuck doing the same things over and over and over. We may not be physically laid out like this man for 38 years, but there have been some of us in here for 10 years that found us as making the same mistakes over and over and over and over and over. I've seen grown men in their 60s, in their 60s thinking they're 28, sagging, just doing the same stuff over and over, riding down the street with rims, just bumping. No teeth, but just bumping along. <laughs> <laughs> They're bumping gums. <laughs> but doing the same thing. That's part of why this particular piece is in there to help us. You don't want to be in a situation. We don't want to be in a situation where we're stuck year after year after year after year with the same mindset, with the same vocabulary, with the same action plan. All of this is meant for us to grow and continue to mature and develop. Tell someone Jesus heals through grace. Jesus heals through grace. Tell them Jesus wants no excuses. Jesus wants no excuses. Tell them Jesus goes to the sick. Jesus goes to the sick. Now look at this as well. It's the Sabbath day when all this happens, which is always amazing too how God works out a special plan. He always he knows exactly what he's doing. You ever been in those moments where things show up right on time? Just right on time. Right at the 11th hour before you were going to cash in all the chips, and then boom, Jesus delivers. The same idea is true here. This man has been healed on the Sabbath day, which we hopefully understand is that's a day of rest. And because the Jews at this time had so stretched this term and distorted the idea of the Sabbath to fit their own agenda, now people got a problem. You know how it is. Sometimes folks see you with a blessing and they got a problem because you got blessed and they didn't. Are they still waiting on your on theirs? This all happens on the Sabbath day. <clears throat> and, and just in terms of the origin of the Sabbath, the Sabbath took place after God finished with his creation. He created all types of living things, us being the last of his creation, mankind being the last. So on the seventh day, he ordained that as a rest. Looking at it in that sense, they had, I said there's been no other creation since, since that time since mankind was created. In other words, when people tell you they've seen UFOs, or they know where Area 52 is, or they know they saw something up in the sky, 
You better ask them what they had to drink before they, <laughs> before they saw it or who their source is. Because once God finished creating mankind, he rested the next day. That was the whole purpose of the Sabbath day. But again, the Jews have stretched this in such a manner now that you, it's like you can't do anything on the Sabbath day. They saw this man, some commoners saw the man carrying his mat, and they questioned him, why are you carrying a mat on the Sabbath day? <laughs> I don't know about you, but if I was in that situation, and I'm willing to bet all of us in here, at least most of us would be in that situation, if we were healed miraculously, miraculously like that, we'd be carrying our mats, we'd be outside of this building, <laughs> shouting, hooping, hollering about how good God has been to us. I don't care what you're trying to put on me. Yes, it's Sunday, but I'm going out and I'm doing this. Same case here. It's the law. The Sabbath is there. But again, they're completely missing the whole message. They probably knew this man who had been sitting there for 38 years. I mean, there's generations of folks in the past have probably seen this man here, laid out. And here he is, and he's walking. They miss the whole message entirely. I'm not concerned that God has healed you. I'm concerned that you're breaking the law. They missed the message. You ever had a blessing? You ever reflect on your life and, and, and recall that maybe that was a blessing that was in store for you, but you missed it because you messed it up? You missed everything that was in place. Everything was getting ready to be laid out for us, and we missed it because we lost focus. These people here missed the whole idea. Interestingly enough, Joshua, if they want to get technical, Joshua on the Sabbath day. What was he doing around Jericho? He was pretty busy that day, ladies and gentlemen. Jericho was marching around to the walls head down. They were working. They were working hard. There was some sweat. And that was on the Sabbath. The idea is Jesus is saying, look, I'm healing. I'm making people well. And you want to argue about the rest, the day of rest. This man can rest plenty now, spiritually, mentally, and physically, because he's been made well. I'll look at someone next to you again and ask them, do you really want to be made well? Now next tell them, Jesus warns with his word. Jesus warns with his word. The man is healed. He's moving. He's getting up and he's getting out. He's got his mat with him. He doesn't know who healed him. But he's moving. Jesus finds him in the temple. And this is just an extraordinary passage in the sense, let's go to Acts, let's look at it, verse 14. I, we gotta read it. Verse 14. Afterwards, Jesus being in that place, excuse me, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, you have been made well. Sin no more, lest the worst thing come upon you. Those are some strong words, ladies and gentlemen. I'm sure some of you are wondering, what is that worst thing? Well, I don't know. And honestly, I don't want to know. He says, sin no more, lest something worse come upon you. And that's coming from Jesus. I wouldn't play with that. But what also does that passage tell us? It tells us, or at least hints at the idea that however that man got to be sick for that long, it probably most likely was because of his sin. His lifestyle of sin. You know, sometimes folks can do stuff in such a way that they've messed up their whole life now. Yeah. We've had people that have said, I've never tried drugs. I've never done drugs before. And they tried just a little bit of something. And they died on the spot because their bodies couldn't take it. Yeah. And no longer with us. Some people have gotten themselves caught up so deep <coughs> that they're locked up. Folks have gotten themselves so caught up that now they're missing limbs. Or they're missing certain things, or can't, they're not as complete physically as they were because they got themselves caught up in situations where they had no business being in the first place. Jesus says to this man, I made you well, but if you keep sinning, if you purposefully keep missing the mark, if you go back to whatever lifestyle you were going back to before you were laid up like this, something worse will come upon you. Now, again, I struggled for a couple of months just being in pain. I can't imagine doing that for 38 years, let alone something worse than that. Yeah. Nobody wants that. So he gives him that word of advice, more so that command. He warns us even with his word as well. The sick people were laying around, of course, and they knew that there was some type of power to the water. All they had to do was get in. 
These days, we're not waiting for any water. We're not waiting for any psychic to tell us anything. We're not waiting for the news to tell us how we should live our lives. What we're waiting on is instruction. It's in the Word of God. We know what we need in order to be made well. The question is, who's going, who's going to get it? Who's going to get the medication? You ever had some medication you just didn't want to take? Yeah. I'm not a pill person. I, I, it's got to be it'd be gummy for me if I'm taking a form of medicine. I'm, I'm like a child. I will pant and scream. I do not want to take anything where I have to swallow the pill. I just can't stand that. But if I want to get made well, you better, you better believe. These past couple of months, I've been drinking and swallowing as much as I could. But the Word of God is our medicine, ladies and gentlemen. That's our healing factor. And we have to make it a point to go to the Word and investigate on our own. So that we can be made well. But only not only being made well, but to get the warnings and the admonition that Jesus gives to us in his word. We already know what's going on. I mean, look, we already know where we're going. We're going one or two places. And we have examples in the word of God that tell us how to live if we want to go to either one of those. We have examples. You better know what those examples are. Some of us could be messing around and repeating and doing things that we know we ought not to be doing. Or doing things we're not aware of. But the word of God will straighten all that out for us. Tell someone Jesus warns us with his word. The man's disease and punishment was most likely due to his sins. Jesus comes on and he heals him physically. Just as he does us physically. But more important than the physical piece, Jesus says, I want to heal your soul as well. That's why he says to the man, make sure you live the way you're supposed to live. Or stop doing this. He wants our souls to be healed as well. Physically, we can be down and out. These bodies, of course, are temporary. Things are going to happen to these bodies. Some things will happen sooner. Some things will happen later for others. That's inevitable. But our soul, our spirit, has to be renewed each and every single day. And there needs to be a focus there because when we leave this body, Again, we're going somewhere. There's going to be a trip somewhere. It's up to for us to understand what example to follow so we go where we really want to go. And last, anybody, anybody go to heaven? Is that everybody here? Okay, good. I just want to make sure. <laughs> but Jesus warned this man with his word in person. And again, he still warns us with his word today. And the last piece, look at verse 15. <clears throat> We understand that the man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. The idea is that God wants us to continue still to spread the gospel. Easier said than done. I would challenge you right now, if you can reflect just off the course of a week, maybe last week, how many times did you share the gospel with someone? Just the last, just last week alone, or better yet, how often did you mention God to other people that you came in, into contact with just last week? Sunday don't count. <laughs> That's a given. He's a hopeful. This man was cured in such a way that he went out and he told the Jews especially, he told them what God had done. How often do we tell others what God has done for us? There's nothing wrong with prayer. There's nothing wrong with asking for prayer on behalf of oneself. But there is something to be said about one who's going out and initiating conversation or initiating the idea that God has done great things for us. Last time I checked, we all woke up this morning. That's a great thing in itself, ladies and gentlemen. Something we oftentimes take for granted. Had a nerve to wake up. Brother Himes helped me this morning. He, he, he gave me a nice call early in the morning. <laughs> he, he assisted with that. But uh, the idea is that... <laughs> You know, I was half, I was half tired, half up and half gone. <laughs> but uh, we woke up. We got to move today. We got to move all the last week in some way, shape, or form. We got to talk to other people. Our senses, we're able to exercise all, most of not all of our senses. We're able to move just with ease for most of us. That itself is something worth talking about. Onto others. I mean, here's a man, again, 38 years, and here you are walking. That's a lot to shout about, but we also have a lot to shout about today as well. Amen. Things happening in the news, things that are happening, and, and you just came this close, this close, and it would have been gone. It would, you would have been out. 
I came to a situation, I was riding home, riding in the left lane, the gentleman was blinking. He started coming over into my lane, then started blinking, didn't he give me enough time, didn't know I was right next to him because he wasn't paying attention. I'm all on the shoulder of the highway. And I thought to myself after it was over, one, thank you, Lord, for protecting me through that. But it was just another day for me. It was just Friday. Just going home to see my family. I already knew what we were going to do when we got home. And my life could have been over just like that because of the negligence of someone else. There's a lot to be thankful for. With that idea, God still wants to make us whole today. We are not complete by any means. We work towards that goal of completion. We work towards being whole. All of us are sick with something, spiritually and or physically. We've all been there as well. But we all have something we're battling with. And like this man who was battling for 38 years, God made him whole instantaneously. God can make us whole as we continue to work and serve him for the purpose that he's called us to serve him for. As we close out the lesson, I just want to re recap the few the core ideas for if you really do want to be made well. One, understanding that Jesus goes to the sick. That's all of us. Jesus doesn't want our excuses. It's a yes or a no. You're going to follow me or you're not, so I know where we stand. Don't give me this half-on half stuff. You're either with me or you're not. Right. He heals us, again, through grace, which means there's nothing, even on our best day, there's nothing we could do to please him on our best day. So we ought not to be getting into a mindset that says, well, you know, I helped change your tire the other day. But Lord, I hope you, I'm waiting for my blessing. I planted some words of encouragement on somebody today. I'm waiting for my blessing. No, we ought not to have that kind of mindset. He heals us through his grace. He warns us with his word. He lets us know. Very much like most of you let your children know. You have a choice. At least that's what I say, especially to my, to my little boy. Well, the oldest boy. You have a choice. <laughs> and many of you have said that or had that said too. We either go do this or the alternative. We're going to do this. It's very clear. And I've been impressed with a four or five year old boy that gets that quickly. I say, which one do you want to do? I'm not going to make you do any of it, but we, there's going to be a consequence. <laughs> and usually he picks the first option. I'm going to go ahead and do what you said, do that. But Jesus warns us as well. We all have choice, we have free will. Jesus is not going to force us into doing anything. Will he get our attention? Oh, yeah. He's not going to force us. We have a choice, and he will respond based on the choice that we make. And he wants to make all of us whole. Again, the last piece. Because all of us, we're empty without him. Sometimes we, you know, we come up to, to that young lady or young man, and we say, you know, you complete me. Not really. Not really. Because when they're gone, or if they're gone, what do you do? Jesus completes all of us. So that no matter what we go through in this world, no matter what tragedies may come fall upon us, God is with us. And he wants to make us whole each and every single day. Again, that's the lesson coming from John chapter 5. I don't know what your position is with the Lord. I don't know what your walk is with him. <clears throat> if you are not a Christian, this is the perfect opportunity to establish an authentic relationship and walk with God. You don't want to wind up doing the same stuff over and over, having to depend upon others for help, like this man had to do. You can come forward and acknowledge you depend on the Lord from here on out. You're going to allow him to be your sole provider in everything that you do as you continue to move forward. <clears throat> if you want to be a Christian and acknowledge that today, one, you must do a couple of things. First, hear the word of God. Upon hearing the word of God, you have to come to a decision of whether or not you believe what's in the scriptures. This is all inspired by God. Upon believing his word, it causes you to have repentance or a change of mind, which says, I'm going to do things the way God wants me to do them. And you would only know that if you follow the roadmap right here. That's the only way you know where you're going. I want to do things according to his word. Upon that repentance or change of mind, it will cause you to come forward and to say publicly, confess that Jesus Christ is the son of the living God. And upon that confession, we'll baptize you right now for the mission of your sins, and you will gain access to the helper, to God's spirit, who will God shape and develop you as you further live and do his will. But we're not done just with that. It's not a one-hit program and you leave. Once you're baptized, you're called to be faithful to him. Again, you're weighing out the cost, because it's not easy being a Christian. It's not easy having to hold your tongue when someone else is giving it to you. It's not easy to have to stand back for a second and gather yourself from folks acting crazy around you. That ain't easy. 
but we're blessed and that much more developed and mature because of it, because we can do that. You better be ready for that journey. There are people here that will help you, but overall it's God alone who will direct and guide you. If you are a Christian and you got that walk, you got that crippled walk going, you're faking it on the outside, but inside you know you're doing some dirty stuff. And it ain't just for us to know, but he does. Just like he told the man, stop sinning unless something else wants to come upon you. If you know you haven't been walking correctly, if you know you've lost your own direction, you know you've just been finding yourself just in a rut. I know I've been in a rut here lately. Just trying to get out and trying to move forward. Allow the Lord to use you and help you. That's between you and your father. Got nothing to do with us here. We're only here for support. But God will take you through all the way. That's an opportunity. Again, if you're not a Christian, please come put Christ on a baptism. If you are a Christian, you need some prayer, you need some assistance, come get it from the Lord as we stand. Have a verse of a song. Pass me now, oh gentle Savior.